You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Irina Risch. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Computer Science and Operations Research Department at the University of Montreal. And we're going to be talking about uh, AI-related uh, topics. So, Irina, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a fascinating topic to talk about. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, tell me, what what is it that you're researching? What are you working on? Well, I'm working on uh, intersection between artificial intelligence and neuroscience. And there are multiple aspects of that, including applications of uh, methods from AI, such as machine learning, like statistical machine learning, to analysis of brain data, neuroimaging, and beyond scanner data, which could include text or speech, wearable devices, uh, with a common kind of goal of trying to trying to detect patterns in the brain data about particular mental states or disorders. And I kind of call this direction AI for neuro. But I also, um, more recently, I'm focusing on the second direction, which goes in the opposite well, direction, neuro for AI. So what can AI learn more from your science? There is uh, so, so much more in the brain that we can uh, kind of look at and borrow to improve uh, AI methods and uh, models. There is much much more to kind of um, uh, use for intuitions and uh, improved approaches. So basically roughly AI for neuro and neuro for AI. Well, some parts of AI are called neural networks. And I guess people from years ago tried to model AI based on how our neurons work and our brain works. Do you think they've been successful or does the brain work in a very different way than any of our current AI systems run? I think that brain works in a very different ways from uh, state-of-art neural networks. And, well, in fact, I do work on deep learning and neural networks myself. And, um, yeah, it's indeed a fascinating history of uh, using inspirations from brain and uh, neuroscience. So what I'm working on right now, of course, is by no means something that has never been done before. And starting with McAuliffe and Pete's good old model many decades ago, the simplified model of neurons that became like basis of the perceptron and later multiple layers of those perceptrons uh, gave rise to, well, modern neural networks or so-called third generation, I mean, second generation neural nets. Uh, This is great. I mean, we all witness huge success of deep learning and multiple applications from vision to natural language to speech and so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, most of the researchers in deep learning, including the fathers of deep learning themselves, like Yosho Benji and Jeff Hinton and um, Jan Lekan, basically the recent recipients of Turing Award, they all agree that we are very, very far from what brain can accomplish um, in our current AI deep learning setting. And the goal right now is to try and bridge that gap. And that's where I think we are all kind of trying to focus our uh, efforts. Well, for people that don't know what constitutes the gap, what can brains do that 
you know, the best AI systems can't do? And how do you think they do it? What's an example? Well, one simple example, common example is um, everybody often brings up this example, how babies learn. Like, do babies really observe millions and millions examples of a cat? Or they typically see a cat or two and they kind of capture the concept quite quickly. So they don't need those millions of examples that deep learning needs. So in um, AI, it's called like uh, sample efficiency or something like that. And the reason is that deep learning, deep networks are being trained from scratch, typically from some random weights, uh, while human brains and those baby brains are anything but networks with random weights. They have lots of prior, lots of structure. It's basically a result of uh, evolution. And that's why we are so efficient at learning from small samples. So this is one limitation. It would be really interesting to see how we can incorporate those priors from neuroscience, perhaps from psychology and psychiatry and other disciplines that study brain, if we can incorporate that into our models so that models do not have to learn from scratch. It's just one example. And second, my actually favorite example is uh, the most successful AI systems today can do really well particular tasks. For example, you can say you can beat human champion and go. Yes, right. yeah. But can you have a system that will beat human champion and go today? Then next day, it will learn how to translate from, I don't know, English to French. Right. That's what I have to do these days because I just moved to Montreal from New York. And yeah. tomorrow, I'm going to learn to generate paintings like modern GANs do against the generative adversarial networks and so on and so forth. So basically, imagine a system that's going to be continuously learning during its lifetime, and it will really learn to do many, many very different tasks without forgetting what it learned yesterday. We don't have such systems now. There is no such thing as truly continually life learning AI, or in other words, it's sometimes called broad AI. I mean, there was this kind of um, notion of narrow to broad to general AI, uh, for example, in uh, various talks by IBM research director, Dario Gill, he likes to call it transition from narrow to broad. And I totally agree with that because I think that's what the first step towards the general AI should be. You go to broad first. We are not there yet. So there is, there is, there is a huge gap. Yeah, it just seems like at best we can string together very narrow, specific AIs to try to accomplish, you know, other tasks, but there's nothing that transitions from task to task, just like you mentioned. It's stuck in what it can do, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, because usual mode of operation for machine learning approaches uh, for decades uh, was statistical learning, assuming one task, a data set, perhaps very large, and the whole approach of machine learning was essentially kind of built on top of uh, good old statistics, how to fit parameters of a model to the data. So you learn, for example, a function, how to map image to label, how to say whether this is cat or dog, so on and so forth. So it's essentially was uh, built by design to solve problems like that. So machine learning is like function approximation problem. But lifelong continual learning, it's very, very hot area of research. There is lots going on. There are workshops and tutorials at the top machine learning conferences like New RIPS, which is happening next week and the ICML and so on. There are multiple groups actively working on that, like uh, for example, UC Berkeley group and Stanford and Anyway, it, it's a really hot area for good reasons because it's challenging and it's fascinating. And a good example of continual lifelong learning environment would be various reinforcement learning tasks where you have to move from environment to environment online or even more robotics. So that's definitely where continual, continual lifelong learning is the problem. And many so other things. What's your gut feel? Is there going to be a gradual transition to broad AI or is it going to require a fundamental rethinking of how things work in order to achieve 
broad or general AI? I think uh, we will witness both. And the reason I'm saying both is that it all depends on the how challenging the environment that your AI system has to live in, how, how challenging it is. If the environment changes, your tasks, your data sets, they change, but they still may be of somewhat similar kind, that perhaps you can get away with current neural network models and you'll need to improve algorithms for learning them. And that's what people are focusing on. And there is lots of progress. You can also try to extend them with various forms of memory and replay and so on. But as environment starts getting more complicated and uh, those different tasks and different uh, settings will be more and more, well, different, I'm not sure that any neural network of current generation will be able to just simply handle it. Again, it's just my current personal hypothesis, but I think that the more complicated the environment will get, the more evolved and complex those models will have to be. And I believe, honestly, we might not get away with simply a fixed size neural network with a fixed set of weights, even if we provide it with some additional uh, memory or um, kind of basically replay buffer, what people call in the field, you might need to start changing this architecture and uh, augment it, adapt it, expand it, although you cannot do it uh, infinitely. But even then, I believe at some point, you may have to replace current second generation neural networks with what people were calling third generation for a while. Actually, the term is not new and it now refers to spiking neural nets or neural nets that take into account time. If you think about second generation of what we use right now, it's neural nets where the environment is encoded in vectors of variables, but say you have N variables, hidden units. And well, say for simplicity, let's assume the binary. How many different things can you encode? Well, two to the power of N. If you take into account the sequence in which those hidden units fire, it's already n factorial. Now imagine you add time to the picture and you can encode things using time between spikes. So it's so-called uh, well, temporal coding versus what we currently use kind of spatial or rate coding. You get much more powerful models whose memory capacity is much, much better than the current generation neural nets. I believe that at some point, if you truly want to do broad AI, you will have to have some notion of dynamic or temporal networks, which are not anymore just those static models. Because uh, the reason I believe that, because if you look at the brain and real neural nets, they are not static. They are constantly firing. They are dynamical systems with many, many coupled variables or units, and they're always active. Even if you don't show them any image of a cat or a dog, even if you sleep, the activity in the brain never ceases. The dynamical system is always running. That's nothing like our current AI systems work. And I think that's the reason for that gap. But again, that's my kind of personal hypothesis. But I think that when we will be able to come up with truly dynamical neural nets, we might have much more capacity for adaptation without forgetting. Where do you think um, knowledge is kept or a knowledge base is kept in the brain? Well, that's that's a really good question. And I don't want to claim I have an answer to that (laughs) because there are different theories. And yet, if you think about various experiments, for example, I was really... Uh, really inspired and kind of amazed by a great talk last year at New Rips Conference uh, 2018. And it was by Michael Levine from Tufts University. And and the talk was called What Bodies Think About. And he has multiple talks on YouTube. It's, I I highly recommend to, to, to view those talks. He was basically showing examples of development of various uh, creatures from like flatworms to like butterflies and so on. And it's really a good question where the memory is, and it's somewhat open question, 
where the memory is even in cellular, not neural networks. And examples of how you can change that memory. <laughs> Why I'm mentioning that basically is that when uh, he would apply certain, uh, say, chemical um, operations on top of those networks, when he would effectively change the dynamics or rewire the bioelectric communications in those networks by maybe opening or closing ion channels and so on and so forth, he could change the shape of those organisms like flatworms would develop two heads and that new attractor state would be stable because if you keep cutting them, they will keep developing two-headed organisms. So essentially he could reprogram biological computer using only software, the dynamics of communication based on bioelectrical signals without touching DNA to make totally different type of organism of, out of single-headed flatworm, two-headed ones, or the ones with different shape of the head. And it kind of really makes you think, so where does the memory about this shape into which the organism will develop, with, where the memory resides? It's clearly not just in DNA. And now this is just flatworms. There is no neural network there. It's just simply the bioelectric uh, network at cellular level. It's a different type of a network. Right, but it right. existed, it existed, it adapted, and it had memory way before the first neuron appeared. So this is quite mind boggling. And to be honest, I would love to be able to understand this better and potentially maybe build AI systems that can do the same. But um, the question where exactly memory resides is a good one. And I guess it depends. Well, there are many, many studies, of course, of memory and brain about hippocampus forming immediate memories well, well, and, uh, yeah, and so on and so it, forth. It's not and only consolidation it's, different, of memory. Yeah. yeah. There's different types of memory too. Like, um, yeah. so, you know, I thought about this. There's, you know, been 120 billion people that have ever lived approximately, supposedly. Yet most of them, if not all of them, have one heart, not two. They have one liver, not two. They have two lungs, not one. And the heart and the lungs and the liver are all a certain shape, certain size, location in the body in relation to each other. We only usually have one brain, not many. It's almost always in a certain place, certain size. And where is the memory for having created that? You know, it must be in the cells themselves. And we start from a single cell, essentially. So all of that memory is in there on how to make, for instance, the whole person. And then you consider in our lives, we, we accumulate memories from our experiences. Our senses take in information and that adds to the, or, or gives us a new kind of memory of experiences and how to act and how to, you know, do things like play tennis or whatever it is. So there's, it sounds like this an initial endowment and then there's other memories that we get from you know from the actual process of learning and existing so it's i don't know how you'd ever reconcile that into an ai system but exactly. you know, that's what i've noticed exactly well even as i said in simpler organisms not human uh, there is clearly memory and dna but the point the point is it's not just there apparently there is memory somehow encoded in uh, this dynamics of interaction. Like imagine, I don't know, you have multiple pendulums as a dynamical system and they are in particular uh, synchronized state and you may get them out of it and they will be in a different state. So there is definitely some memory that resides not in DNA, but rather in something that determines dynamics of the cellular communication with neural communication being even more complicated because while well, neurons as cells inherited some ways of uh, communication that their predecessors had. So like, for example, it's not just synaptic uh, connections, but uh, there are so-called gap junctions or direct electric connections between neurons, uh, which by themselves are fascinating because they relate to potentially various disorders such as epilepsy. And there is interesting work on that in neuroscience. We recently had a talk by a world famous uh, neuroscientist on epilepsy, Roger Traub from IBM Research, talking about the hypothesis around how gap junctions and onset of epileptic seizures may be related. 
So there is much more, bottom line, there is so much more about brain and even just about uh, cellular networks that we as AI people may need to learn about if we really would like to build next generation models and algorithms. There is so much there that may give us those intuitions and maybe a new kind of models will be developed. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally fascinating. It's quite open, but I think, I think if we try to go towards more interdisciplinary research on intelligence, uh, which includes, of course, AI, but well, people thought about mind and brain for many thousands of years, way before AI appeared, right? There was philosophy, uh, there was, well, neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, and so on and so forth, and biology. And all those disciplines kind of approach the question of what intelligence is from different angles. So I think if you try to, if you try to connect the dots, if you try to come up with um, general theory of intelligence from multiple perspectives, I, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but if you try, I think you might come up with very interesting novel ideas, models, algorithms that probably going to be much more powerful than what we have right now. Sure, but any, I mean, any insights into uh, how you would do that? Like, you know, what I was thinking as you were talking is, is there any complex task that where an AI could use the, like a, a set of dependent AIs that have already mastered aspects of the task and it can call upon those and make essentially a network of networks to accomplish a more complex task? That's, uh, that's perhaps a good approach. Yeah, you can use uh, specialized components that can do particular task well. And in fact, it is probably what brain does anyway, if you think about that, because you have visual cortex that kind of is responsible for, well, processing visual information. You have auditory cortex that does the same with auditory signals. You have motor cortex that, roughly speaking, is responsible for movements. You have your prefrontal cortex that, again, roughly speaking, is responsible for rational thinking, for um, planning, and other high-level cognitive functions. So your neural net, the natural neural net, it already has those components which are not completely independent. They're overlapping, and they're working together. So the question could be, for AI and neural nets we have right now, how do you develop those semi-independent mechanisms or sub-networks or components that during execution of particular tasks uh, can be working together and maybe just some subset of them is needed. So uh, as Yosho Benjo really likes to put it together, it's all about combining independent mechanisms, independent com components in the um, real time when you need to do a particular task, quickly combining them using some attention mechanism and selecting what to execute next, like some kind of a routing or dynamic execution. So this is perhaps uh, the first step towards coming up with this uh, um, kind of uh, functionality, uh, the broad functionality, the um, versatile AI is to expose a system to a set of very, very different tasks over time, uh, kind of keep doing this continual lifelong learning or what like Tom Mitchell from CMU calls never ending learning. So similar ideas. You keep exposing system to that and you allow the system to grow. Uh, one of the papers actually we did a couple of years ago was on neurogenetic dictionary learning. For example, although it's very simplistic model, but the idea was to bring inspirations from adult neurogenesis or the process of uh, uh, growth of new neur neurons in adult brains in hippocampus, particularly in dentigerous, and uh, come up with a model that not only would kind of describe how it's happening, but also show why it's advantages for adult brains to still grow new neurons. And that paper, it was HK 2017 paper, essentially 
demonstrated in kind of much more simplified case that if you allow your architecture to grow, but also you control the growth because, I mean, you have limited skull, you cannot grow a neural net forever, right? So if you combine birth of new neurons with death of unnecessary ones, and that's all, by the way, controlled automatically via optimization process um, that details in the paper. If you do that, you end up with um, kind of maybe more specialized subnetworks. And at the end of the day, you have a network of the same size, say that some fixed network, this, which can be more adaptive without forgetting. And one of the examples we demonstrate in the paper is that if you show adaptive or neurogenetic network, a sequence of environments, environments will be changing, then this adaptive network will grow and kill neurons as needed. It will perform better than the network that never had the opportunity to be neurogenetic or to expand and compress, although that kind of standard network would have the same size. Bottom line, that paper on one hand was showing that the neurogenetic process, as described in neuroscience papers, happens for reason when the environment changes, and especially like in rats, when they shown like a, when they put in a different um, complexity environments, and it's like interesting, and there is lots of learning occurring, and environment changes all the time, uh, while the rats which are put in the environment, which is very uninteresting and nothing changes there, do not seem to have that much neurogenesis. Basically, use it or lose it. So we, on one hand, show computational model of adult neurogenesis, while on the other hand, you get AI algorithm with adaptive architecture, which performs better than the classical fixed architecture. So kind of win-win situation. So that was kind of one example of uh, what I would call somewhat neuro-inspired uh, approaches to AI. And uh, similarly, we tried other inspirations such as um, better methods for training existing neural nets, basically going beyond backpropagation, not necessarily using the good old classical backpropagation algorithm that pretty much is like uh, the method for training neural nets right now, because most of the neural net software implements backpropagation. But it doesn't have to be this way. And there are other ways to train neural nets. And people are exploring those alternatives. And we kind of also added two cents by our ICML paper this year on Beyond the Probe, uh, right. which was loosely inspired by somewhat different aspects of uh, propagation, like basically the credit assignment of propagation of error on neural nets. There is also well, lots of how, work around that. How do, how do rats, I mean, has anyone like tried to look at I don't know, hundreds of neurons in a rat and expose it to a stimuli and see what it's doing to learn. And it, is it back propagating? Is it, you know, how is it taking in information and processing it? Have we, do we have any idea on how that's done at all by any creature? Well, um, I mean, there are, there are multiple observations and um, kind of debates whether brain implements back prop or not. And um yeah, there is some recent work on this. But in fact, we're going to have a mini workshop at Mila on Thursday this week, exactly uh, devoted to the topic of beyond backprop approaches to learning, with several talks, including like Blake Richards, myself, Yoshio Benjo, Gael Warqua, from Neura inspired, like Blake Richard is actually working on more detailed uh, approach where each neuron is modeled, not just a node, simplistic node, a variable, but it has certain structure. And his paper on segregated dendrites from last year points in this direction. So uh, in a sense, yes and no. I mean, you can uh, definitely say that there is propagation of error somehow, but it doesn't have the same properties as a backprop algorithm uh, that is currently implemented in neural nets. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not that trivial to just kind of look at the sequence of neurons firing and figure out how exactly error is being propagated. 
So it's a, it's a good question. But there are definitely some aspects of that that can be more biologically plausible. For example, um, methods, well, including ours and other people, and also so-called target propagation, which actually Jan Khan himself proposed a long time ago, though it wasn't working that well empirically, and Yoshio Benji worked on that with his students, and uh, they had paper on different target propagation. Then, then Jeff Hinton with uh, his collaborators had a paper last year at NIPS um, uh, basically on evaluating these different methods and whether they're scalable. Those results were somewhat negative, but it basically was indication that maybe we didn't try hard enough. And that's why people continue exploring more biologically plausible alternatives and trying to see what approaches could be better than backpropagation in what environments. And again, it, it, it's actually subfield, emerging subfield of um, current deep learning on its own, I would say. That's why, as I said, that Miller Waven decided to have a mini workshop on that. Yeah, so there are many, many other um, kind of topics at this intersection of neuroscience inspirations and how you could use and which inspirations to improve existing state of art. Because there are many properties right. of the brain that uh, neural networks do not have now. For example, robustness to various things besides just changes in the input. You probably know well the adversarial um, kind of samples or images. You slightly perturb the input image so that human eye will not really detect a difference. But poor neural network can be very much deceived by this adversarial version of the image and misclassify it terribly. So this lack of uh, stability or robustness to some forms of noise and then, of course, we all know that deep networks are extremely sensitive to uh, their hyperparameters, to the learning rate, to the architecture, and so on and so forth. So tweaking neural nets to make them work takes a lot of time and effort. And, uh, well, human brains, if they were so brittle, I wouldn't, <laughs> we probably wouldn't survive. So there is definitely right, something right. much more stable and robust in the design of real neural nets, that artificial neural nets should still try to kind of learn about. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're close to being out of time. What, what resources do you recommend for people that want to learn more about, um, you know, AI and, uh, and then also how, I mean, regular cognition works in various creatures and people, et cetera. What, any recommendations on papers that you could recommend then or resources for people? Sure. Um, I mean, there were, okay, so one thing I can definitely recommend, uh, there is a conference called Maine, uh, Montreal AI and Neuroscience Conference. And uh, just kind of happened a few weeks ago. It was a third one in a row. You can find it online and you can uh, basically look at the people and their talks who participated there. So you'll get some um, idea about what topics are of interest. There are various uh, Various uh, kind of position papers or overview papers out there online. Uh, you can look at, uh, I think, Surya Ganguly from Stanford has a web page on that. There is definitely, I think, links from DeepMind. Uh, I also have my own um, kind of attempt to compile a list of papers on the intersection of AI and neuroscience uh, on different aspects of, such as attention, reinforcement learning, and so on. Uh, I think just Googling neuroscience and AI or the intersection of those uh, will immediately give you a bunch of links. And as I said, DeepMind is definitely in, like, working in this direction. Stanford does. People at Mila and University of Montreal, uh, especially those who co-organized that conference called Maine. Uh, yeah, so I, I would definitely look there. But uh, I think that even simple Google search on Neuroscience-inspired AI can give already a few links uh, for that particular intersection. All right. And what's the best way for people to contact you to ask questions? Um, you can Google me and you'll see my web page and my contact information is there. So you can just drop me email. So all, all my information is online. At, it, it's at Mila webpage. Okay, very good. Well, Irina, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was it was really interesting. Yeah, and sorry for running a bit out of time. That's okay. <laughs> You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.